So um, I'm going to talk today about something that um, is relatively new. We, uh, I usually talk about things that we didn't publish because I'm more excited about this rather than about published things. Plus, you guys can talk to read it already. So I'm going to talk about um, our studies of physisorption of biomolecules um, to either flat surfaces or um, uh, curved surfaces such as nanoparticles. So my group does... Um, basically a range of, we use a range of different methods, everything from quantum mechanics all the way to actually finite element um, uh, simulations, but we specialize really in the um, methods that are based on Newton's equation of motion. So that would be atomistic MD, coarse grain molecular dynamics simulations, and dissipative particle dynamics, right? So this is our specialty. We use quantum mechanics, again, to parameterize certain uh, parameters in the force field. And sometimes we use finite elements to actually look at the large scale propagation of the stresses in the materials. Since we look at nanobio and soft matter interactions, we also use bioinformatics, such as um, you know, secondary and tertiary structure prediction of biomolecules in our simulation methods. Um, this basically gives a quick overview of um, uh, several research directions that we uh, work in our research group. Again, uh, we use everything from complete computational biology, which is uh, tertiary structure prediction of transmembrane proteins without known homologs. Two, um, of course, uh, designer solvents, where most of the things in soft matter depends on the solvents, specifically polymer nanocomposites are highly dependent on the choice of the solvent. And we're interested actually in the role of the solvent in the morphology formation here. Smart materials by default are very sensitive to the solvent. So that will be the second part of the talk. I will talk about our predictive methods for um, understanding um, structure in response of the smart materials. And right now I'm going to talk about this area where we're looking at properties and property processes at the surfaces and interfaces. And specifically, um, we're looking at um, how to optimize the surface in order to get a very distinct response of biomolecules on these surfaces. And again, I start from the flat surfaces and then move on. And another example where we have um, nanoparticles. So, okay, here. So why do we care about, in general, surface or biosurface functionization? Again, it's um, the beauty of this. You can keep the bulk properties of the uh, inert materials, which could be organic or inorganic. And then you add more interesting properties to this, such as biocompatibility, solubility, and of course, selectivity. That's one of the most important parameters that we get out of uh, biofunctionization. Uh, traditionally, you can see in the reviews that people uh, show the covalent or chemisorption of the molecules to the surface. A variety of biomolecules has been already um, used in this process, such as peptides, nucleic acids, antibodies, dendrimers. And we use this type of surfaces, which are functionalized, again, with biomolecules, taking the best out of biomolecules and the best of inorganic surfaces. Traditionally, again, in biosensors, where we could can put nucleic acids or, for example, antibodies for the sensing part or, you know, tissue scaffolds, bioelectronics, as you can see here, and of course, self-assembly. However, we are very well aware whether we have a covalent attachment of the molecules to the surface or non-covalent, as we see here, the properties of the surfaces and thus devices performance will depend on the structure of these interfacial biomolecules, right? So our specific structural response to absorption of the surface, again, whether we have it covalent or non-covalent, will change the surface property and thus a device performance. We're specifically interested in um, uh, physics option. We uh, use some of the, um, you know, basically, a covalent approach only to look at the differences. So traditionally, again, you can functionalize, let's say, siRNA to the surface through um, a linker, and it will be a permanent covalent attachment. Or with physics option, you use a non-covalent approach where your attachment of the biomolecule bio to the surface is driven by non-bonded interactions. And that could be electrostatic, it could be Van der Waals hydrogen bonds, pi-pi stacking interaction, anything. 
So for example, here the peg layer, layer on the um, gold surface is charged, so the end groups are protonated amines, you can see here, and the uh, um, negatively charged aside RNA can absorb on this surface. However, there's a lot of problems associated with that, whether we're going to retain the base pairs, whether we're going to retain the structures, what should be the optimal surface charge density right here that allows us to, this, to retain the properties of biomolecules. And generally, if you're not retaining the properties of biomolecules, it might lead to the degradation um, of these biomolecules. So anyhow, with uh, phase absorption, we have a lot of positive, um, or a lot of advantages here. Right? First of all, it's very easy. It has no surface pretreatment. All you have to do is dip material into solution that contains biomolecules. It's not destructive, and it's very cheap. However, the biggest issues associated with phase absorption, again, that we don't necessarily know how the molecule is going to respond to a specific property. So it might lead to conformational changes of biomolecules, which again, detrimental to the performance, and also stability, right? Again, this type of uh, interactions is dependent on the quality of non-bonded um, interactions, and that means that molecules in some cases can detach quickly and will lose the stability of the surface. So the biggest question in phase absorption, again, what are the desired surface properties that will give you control over the secondary structure or a property of the biomolecule? And that's what we are um, interested in. For this type of um, the first part, we're going to look at DNA molecules in the general, my group like working with DNA. Um, DNA used in a variety of um, material science projects. So for, why do we care? And you guys probably know, but I'm quickly going to say the most important part here. DNA is polyelectrolyte, right? It's really highly negatively charged. Every monomer on the backbone is negatively charged. Plus it has this molecular recognition um, properties that associated with the base pairing. And because of this molecular recognition properties, mostly because of this, we use DNA in a variety of different applications from, you know, again, technologically relevant smiley faces or, you know, general, much more complex now DNA origamis to attaching DNAs to the surfaces for, let's say, sensor development or nanoscale materials assembly. Again, looking at bioelectronic and metallization of DNA here, we're looking at, let's say we can use, this is actually an example from RNA, but it's the same concept, where we can create a specific fold or even just stretch a DNA on the surface and use a positively charged nanoparticle to get deposited into this structure, which will lead to uh, formation of specific inorganic wires, right? So for example. So again, DNA is used in many different applications, um, and the beauty of this is that we can have programmed um, assembly, we can have a pretty good sensor capabilities as we've been using for the last 15 years in different applications and also materials with tunable properties. So again, we, we'll look at DNA and how it's absorbed first on a specific surface. So we want to see, um, we want to choose a surface that actually is possible to modify in a controlled manner. So not to be very original, we choose the graphene surface, right? And the graphene surface is very simple. It's also, you spend almost no time calculating it. It has outstanding mechanical, thermal, and electrical properties. But most importantly for our um, study here that we can control change properties in a controlled fashion, change the properties of these graphene surfaces by basically oxidizing it. So, Again, we can modify the surface chemistry. Um, if it is known that once you oxidize the graphene surface, you form epoxy groups and hydroxyl groups, right? So it's a combination of epoxy and hydroxyl groups on the surface, which changes its polarity. Technically, we can go from, again, full graphene all the way to 20, 30% of graphene oxide. Um, after this, the so structure no longer resembles flat surface, so it's starting to crumble, and you see a little bit not a consistent performance. So 
using this type of surfaces, again, going from graphene to a 20% uh, graphene oxide, we're going to study how polarity of the surface affects the phase absorption of biomolecules. We're going to look at DNA and an example of silk, just for the interest of that. So what we know so far, I mean, we know the first people who thinking of choosing the polarity and controlling the polarity with graphene oxide. This is a recent paper, 2014, 13, 14, that's showing the interactions, simulations specifically, of um, biomolecules with graphene and graphene oxide surfaces. So you can see in this study, there was a small peptide that had the three alpha helices right here. In this study was a one long alpha helix, and here was an enzyme with a very specific catalytic pocket. What they found that on a graphene, you generally you see the adsorption and then there's some loss of the um, structure, secondary structure of the biomolecule. However, on graphene oxide, we see the absorption and the general retention of the secondary structure. The same as here, you can see on graphene oxide, we retain the alpha helix. However, on graphene, this um, molecule is uh, denaturating. If we compare it to this study, it's an opposite effect here. And it's just, again, representative studies. We can see that on graphene, this study shows the enzyme actually retains its structure and stability versus on graphene oxide, it actually deforms the active site, which means that we have a severe reduction in catalytic activity in here. So there is a general disagreement. There is more papers that shows this type of behavior that, again, graphene denaturates secondary structure. Graphene oxide generally preserves it. And there are some studies that also shows that it's an opposite effect. So um, we decided to join uh, the, uh, um, this type of research and uh, try in a controlled manner, go from graphene to slowly oxidizing it to a higher level of graphene oxide and see what happens to our structures. We use atomistic MD simulations for here. Now for, for this, again, you guys must have, might, might be familiar with this, but the best thing about atomistic MD, if you have a decent force field um, for your um, um, uh, biomolecules and surfaces, all you need is a set initial potentials, a set initial particle positions and temperature pressure, and then all you have to do is integrate equation of motion, and again, your result will depend on the quality of your force field, but in generally, it's believed to be reasonable. So the first thing we decided to do, we, um, you know, the structure of a single strain of DNA in solution is still controversy, and I'm going to talk about it more on the second lecture, but here I want to show that a lot of people actually assume that this is how the single stranded DNA is going to be in solution. It just kind of sits like this, and then it's going to be absorbed on the surface. And in studies, that's what you see people do. They bring this extended DNA to the surface and then see how it absorbs. However, DNA again, single strand DNA negatively charged, and then we have this aromatic bases here, which are slightly hydrophobic, so they don't like to be extended into solvent. So if we do the molecular dynamic simulations um, on just simply this strand in solution, and all of my movies are sped up, so they're kind of much faster than it's what it should be, you can see that it folds into this loops structures, which are actually held together through pi pi stacking and some um, non-canonical base pairs. So it basically becomes um, more relatively of a globular shape. What, what 0.1 right here. Um, so it's a, you know, a little bit, uh, it depends on the ionic strengths, but it, right, this example will go with 0.1 mole. So what we see um, at the end, if we're looking at our structure, uh, this is polythymine. So we have, again, the pi-pi interactions, and we have thymine-thymine base pairing, right? So it's a non-canonical global base pair. For RNA, it would be UU. This is TT, right? So this is actually um, kind of flexible base pair that um, usually stabilized by one to maximum two hydrogen bonds. We also looked at, uh, before we chose the lengths, uh, what would be the lengths that has the maximum, not the maximum, but has a reasonable amount of um, pi-pi interactions and pi-pi stacking. 
uh, for some reason my screen I think is a little bit bigger so this is the average number of pi stacks and I only show here the blue lines so disregard this part so here we see that basically up to 15 um, bases long we don't have a consecutive pi stack after this we have some consecutive pi stacks and if we're looking at timing and timing interactions again it's a wobble base pair right so it has um, it can change the conformation again up to 15 base pairs we don't see much of this time and time in base pairing and after that we have a certain amount of the base pairing so we chose for our study um, actually the 20 mer DNA for this example that I'm going to go through right now which has some of the consecutive pi pi stacks and also have um, a certain amount of base pairing um, generally, our simulations agrees with the force extension curves um, of single-stranded DNA of polythymine specifically. That shows there is some secondary structure formation, which is basically associated with non-canonical non base pairing. So uh, we took our pre-folded structure, brought it close to the uh, um, surface and here I'm showing two examples this is graphene this is graphene oxide again you see a combination of epoxy and hydroxyl groups about the same as an experiment as expected this has been published many times that DNA whether we start with extended or folded structure basically absorbs on the graphene surface and loses all of this compactness so it becomes flat However, on the graphene oxide, we see again DNA adsorbs on the surface, it forms hydrogen bonds here, and then basically retains all these pi pi interactions that is formed there. So we see that again a graphene, single stranded DNA, loses its original folded structure, and on graphene oxide and 20% graphene oxide, it actually remains almost intact. It can flip and rotate on the surface. The strength of interaction here is much less as compared to this case right here. We can also quantify that type of process through calculating again pi pi interactions. The blue line right here is DNA DNA base. The red line right here is DNA base surface. <coughs> and what we see here is again uh, on graphene we lose the DNA base base interactions and we pick up DNA uh, surface interactions. So pi pi interactions on the surface obviously are dominant and we can see at the end this kind of spreading out. And again, it's, um, it's pretty typical observation. We wasn't surprised by that. For the 20% of our graphene oxide, if we can look at the base base interactions, we basically retain most of them and also we have retain um, just one actually pi pi interaction formed and it's not increasing either. So this simulation is again a relatively small system, it was 100 nanoseconds, we didn't see a change in a trend. So next thing we decided to look at the um, variation again between graphene and graphene oxide and we in controlled manner changing the uh, um, level of polarity on the surface. Um, here we're looking at how well it spreads on the surface, so we're looking actually at the density profile of DNA along the z-axis away from the surface. So if it's flat, as in the case of graphene, you're going to see the density maximum density is close to the surface, and that's what we see right here. And um, if it's extended, such as in this case of graphene oxide 20%, we see this gray line right, that has a much higher um, density away from the surface and it's calculated over the whole trajectory. What was interesting for us in this case that if we have 5% of graphene oxide, we see a shift in the density in a way that we retain some of this structure but really few. And then we have very similar profiles between graphene oxide 5 and 15%. So it's a different regime as compared to just pure graphene. And again, changing it from 15 to 20% led to another shift right here, whereas this DNA now is um, only participating with um, hydrogen bonds with the surface and retains its pi pi interactions. So we have um, three different Scenarios in this case. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you, you have quite a bit of bowing in yes. uh, the graphene oxide. How are you measuring the, the distance? 
From the center of mass, 90 degrees towards the surface. So even if it's moving, we take the center of mass of DNA and we calculate it with a vector 90 degrees to the surface. Interacting this. What? Um, it's, uh, it's low sum aromaticity, right? So you put 20% of epoxies and hydroxys groups, you kill the aromaticity. If you go higher, it's actually going to crumble even more. So if you go higher than 20%. Like you don't have a uh, no, we don't have it. We, it's actually free floating right here. Yeah. It's a free floating, thank you. It's a small flake. Um, we also wanted this to happen, actually, because um, we wanted it to flex a little bit, so it's, it wasn't on purpose. Thank you for pointing it out. Okay, so the next thing we decided to see how different it is in terms of the properties. One of the properties that we like the most is persistent links. Um, it's a basic mechanical property, basically shows you the stiffness of um, the uh, um, polymer. It's very easily estimated from MD simulations, right? All you have to do is calculate the vector correlation analysis throughout the backbone. So it's relatively precise in terms of, again, getting this information from MD simulations. And it's also known from experimental perspective of view that we um, can impact mechanical properties, electrical conductivity, all kind of different things by changing the persistent lengths of the uh, um, molecule. So here's the measure of the persistent length. This baseline here is represents approximate persistent lengths, again calculated by us, of the DNA in the solution. And this is oxygen coverage of the graphene. So this is pure graphene, this is 20%. And this is actually different sequences, so we were looking specifically as polythymine in this case. What we see is generally linearly decreases as you increase the oxidation coverage. You see uh, the linear decrease in the persistent length until it approaches approximately the persistent length of the original or DNA in solution. Right? So that shows us that even the 15% on the previous slide shows us that we lost some of the secondary interactions, we still retain the flexibility similar to uh, the one received in solution. So basically high levels of oxygen let us retain the single-stranded DNA fold and its basic mechanical properties. So then uh, we decided to see if this is going to be the case for much stiffer molecules such as double-stranded DNA. We took a very short seg segment on this. Why we did we do this? We wanted to have the exact comparison uh, for the number of bases, right? So we had 20 bases for single-stranded DNA. We have two, 10 base pairs for double-stranded DNA. And again, if we um, I think I did not animate this. And if we look at the graphene versus graphene oxide, again, these movies are highly sped up, right? So it's a skipping a lot of steps. You can see that the double-stranded DNA also tries to form pi-pi stacking interactions on the graphene. However, in this case, we also retain some of the base pairs. And for graphene oxide, again, the DNA is strongly bound through hydrogen bonds to the um, surface of the uh, um, graphene oxide and uh, retains some, most of the base pairs, however it loses its helicity. So this high oxidation level of graphene oxide is actually also n not maintaining the um, helicity of double-stranded DNA. So if we're comparing it here, again this is the uh, height distribution. We can see that in case of double-stranded DNA, again it's um, spreads stronger on the uh, graphene than graphene oxide. However, the difference here is less than in the case of single-stranded DNA. How large do these uh, aromatic ions need to be in order to still see pi pi stacking interaction? 10%. So that's 10%. So, so it would be. So you can see here, you also have, like if you look at right here, there's still some islands of aromaticity, yeah. but it's not enough. So it's usually only can form like one or two pi pi stacks and it's not mobile. So it cannot move once it's attached to the surface because it's steric hindrance. 
So with 10%, it can still form more than two pair 10 mer. So it's Um, if we compare the uh, non-bonded interactions, which one interacts better, single-stranded or double-stranded DNA with graphene versus graphene oxide? So black here is non-bonded interactions within the DNA, so that's all of them, base pairing, pi pi stacking, and hydrogen bonds. And the red one is interactions between DNA and the surface, and this is pi pi stacks or hydrogen bonds, or both, a combination of that. We can see again that for this is a little snippet of the simulations for single-stranded DNA. Originally, we lose, again, the reason I'm showing the beginning of simulations because here we see some kind of change and then it stabilizes after that. Um, we see that we lose some of the strengths within the DNA, with, within the DNA interaction. Sorry, I'm showing the wrong curve. And then um, the uh, DNA basically retains the rest of this uh, um, strengths and also has um, interacts stronger within itself than with the surface. For graphene, of course, it interacts much stronger with the surface than with itself, as we can see here. For the double-stranded DNA, we can see here we have a competition between the strengths within the DNA versus strengths within the surface, and that leads to the loss of the helicity. The 20% oxidation level is too much for double-stranded DNA. We'll lose the helicity here. For graphene, again, we see a difference as compared to um, single-stranded DNA, but again, it interacts stronger with the surface than within itself. So this means, again, if we're talking about the strengths of absorption on the surface, the graphene would be a better choice for both single-stranded and double-stranded DNA. However, with the oxidation levels, will control the retention of the pi pi stacking or some of the helicity. Um, um, as compared to just simply phys absorption. So the, I noticed that you only have three nanoseconds for the GS DNA. Is that because it happens much faster? Yeah, no, no, it's just we wanted to highlight this, this jump right here. Otherwise, you can see it and you're going to see just a flat level. So we just zoomed in in the beginning. So it's a zoom in version. It's 100 nanoseconds, both of them. All right, so. Overall, uh, we see that, you know, again, the uh, nucleic acids, both single-stranded, double-stranded DNA, tend to retain um, some structure on the uh, high level of oxidation, such as specifically 20%. And we were starting to wonder whether this 20% is uh, something that of interest is. That is a specific magic number for the biomolecules. So we decided to... Um, well, actually, we, we didn't decide it. The, um, uh, Vladimir Tsukruk from Georgia Tech, he's an expert in creating the composites out of graphene oxide and silk. And he also noticed a very similar behavior as we did with this um, graphene oxide behavior, but for the silk structure. So in his case, again, he showed that if you combine the bombox moric silk of about 3,000 bases amino acids long, he shows the high improvement over the modulus and toughness. The hypothesis for this improvement was that silk contributes to some kind of interactions with graphene oxide, and uh, which leads to a better composite structure. Moreover, they compared silk to um, silicon dioxide right here. So it's experimental again, it's not our studies, right? And for silicon dioxide, again, because they sought the morphology and secondary structure of silk as some kind of contribution to this type of interactions, they took a more polar surface, right? Silicon dioxide is pretty polar. What they saw, that the random coil, which is disorder, actually is higher on silicon dioxide as compared to graphene oxide for silk. And also they see that there is a higher percentage of secondary ordered structures, such as alpha helix on graphene oxide, as compared to silicon dioxide, right? So it's contrary to what we were thinking, that the higher the polarity, the better it is for this retention of the ordered elements of the structures. So they believe that the surface of graphene oxide might promote crystallization. And there's a magic number, which is again, um, specifically a high level of oxidation, 20%. 10% didn't work. And uh, that level of oxidation is this higher ordered fraction of ordered uh, elements, which leads to a better mechanical properties. 
So this is basically a simulation setup of what we used. Again, the silk structure has a combination of a crystalline and amorphous sides. We chose a specifically about 260 amino acid segment, which has of Bombox mori, which has the same distribution of crystalline and amorphous regions or crystalline amorphous sequences as in the whole Bombox mori. We use the bioinformatics to create the first actually structure. Um, well, it's easy because you know crystal structure of crystalline silk is there. So basically, we created this long structure and deposited onto the surface. And again, we study three different surfaces: graphene, graphene oxide, which has a combination of epoxy and hydroxyls, and silicon dioxide. For silicon dioxide surface, technically, you have two different. Um, contributors here. We have silanols, either single or germinal silanoids. So basically it's the same as hydroxyl groups here. And then we have siloxane bridges right here, which is very similar to the epoxy groups here. So this type of, again, um, similar um, surface structure in terms of um, flatness. However, also we have here many different, basically all the siloxane bridges are the, um, the majority of the structures and it means that everything is covered with basically epoxies and there's some hydroxyl groups on it. So it's much more polar in general. We did expect a similar response to these two structures. And um, if we look at this structure, so this is our initial um, structure, it had a high level of crystallinity. This is, was amorphous region and this was amorphous region. On graphene, we again see this spread, but in general, maintenance of some of the secondary structures. And then graphene oxide versus silicon dioxide has a almost similar distributions. If we look at the diffusion coefficient of the silk on the surface, again, graphene, um, the silk basically slides around the surface and graphene oxide and silicon dioxide has almost the same um, um, sliding forth. We also see that if we're looking at the height distribution, silicon dioxide and graphene oxide also have the same one. So we don't see any difference here. We also don't see any difference in terms of non-bonded interactions in the way that uh, we overall, compared to graphene, the silk actually binds stronger to graphene oxide and even slightly stronger to silicon dioxide. The distributions here, this is electrostatic and this is uh, Van der Waals interactions. If we calculate the internal bonds on graphene versus graphene oxide, silicon dioxide, again in graphene we see the slight denaturation of the silk and it's going to continue if we show it more. For graphene oxide and silicon dioxide we still, still see primarily maintenance of the secondary structures. Um, and then we see the uh, um, interactions with the surfaces generally increase and they're going to continue flatten out about 100 nanoseconds. So again, we don't see much of a difference here. Slightly different distributions, but on average is the same. What we saw as a difference is actually um, interactions of uh, backbone versus side chain for graphene oxide versus silicon dioxide. And this is the biggest difference within um, how the silk responds to these two different structures. So for graphene oxide, backbone forms more hydrogen bonds with the surface than for silicon dioxide. And here we have more hydrogen bonds formed with the side chains. We know that backbone and proteins is the most important in terms of uh, forming uh, local structural parameters which control the overall protein folds. So what does it mean for us if we compare, so we can see that backbone actually forms more hydrogen bonds with the surface. If we uh, look at all of the secondary structure analysis on the surface, we see that here is the average or change in secondary structures. This is zero. Positive means more secondary structure, negative means less secondary structure. We can see for graphene, this is disorder, so it's coiled, so the uh, protein denaturates. We also see on silicon dioxide, protein denaturates, more coiled structures are formed. However, for graphene oxide, we see that again, disorder is, or coil structures are decreasing and secondary elements are increasing. Okay, so, yeah. 
with a change in the pattern of oxidation? It does. Twenty percent is actually a magic number. So five, so five. It's random distributed, right? So we do it absolutely random. So if you like take a second simulation with a different random distribution, how much would this disturbance? Oh, uh, each of these simulations repeated three times for, uh, for the different random number. Um, so it's you know it's based on the three different surfaces basically with the same oxidation level. It has a standard deviation, but the trends are the same. That's why we put the change in secondary structure instead of like a real number. And this is actually uh, the best representation, right? So for example, this is one of the surfaces that showed a more clear trend in terms of, again, disorder is decreasing on graphene oxide and order is increasing with time in graphene oxide. But generally, the trends are the same for all three of them. So um, we see that actually for graphene oxide, again, we have an agreement with, as compared to silicon dioxide with the experiment. We don't have the same formation of the alpha helices. Actually, we have more beta, uh, beta um, sheets formed here, but that's actually probably related to the quality of the force felt. Because we have some of the increase in the alpha helix, which is this orange, and you can see slightly more than for silicon dioxide, but not as much as beta sheets and beta turns. All right, so that was our major contributor. So in general, we got um, an interesting um, results. We also see with this time frame that actually we are recovering, so compared to our regional structure, we see the rearrangement and recovery of the uh, secondary structure elements. That's why it's increasing, so we have um, the Interactions with the backbone with the surface leads to recovery of this type of um, elements. So the only difference again we saw between these two interactions, the secondary structure is very different because again the way the backbone and the uh, side chains interact with the surface and this relates to the distribution um, of the polar groups on the surface. Okay, so again what we found Graphene has very strong binding with biomolecules, but stru secondary structure is not retained. Polar surfaces are generally better for secondary structure retention, and we found that this has to be a Goldilocks rule, so that means more investigation has to be done into other different surfaces too, to see what means not to polar, not to hydrophobic, right? So again, very polar surface such as silicon dioxide um, also was not very good for secondary structure for silk, for example, whereas um, hydrophobic surface is also not good. Uh, the person who did this work is Ho Shin, and he's continuously working on improving that. So we're looking at more surfaces and more biomolecules to um, get a better idea whether it's a general observation or observation only pertinent to silk and DNA. Okay, so the next part, and I'm talking too slow, right? I have to be, pick it up. Too many things. All right, so the next part is um, looking at DNA and interactions with nanoparticles. And so there's two, um, here we're actually only looking at the uh, uh, modification of the surface charge of the nanoparticle and see whether we can get the bending which is important, or wrapping, which is important for drug delivery, or we can get a stretching of the DNA, or decoration of DNA, which is important for, um, for example, bioelectronics. So again, we're trying to design a nanoparticle which will give us a very specific um, response. If you wrap the, the DNA um, too tight on a nanoparticle, the enzyme will degrade it, so it has to be just right. The question is, what is just right? The just right would be the same as the on the histone protein, right? So that would be just right. So we should have exactly the same DNA conformation, which retains all of the base pairs and also has a very specific tilt and roll parameters as we have it on histone and on a nanoparticle. We also would like to have no denaturation when DNA or anything else absorbs on this nanoparticle. So uh, here we have the histone protein is about 10 nanometers uh, um, in diameter. So we choose a nanoparticle with about 
the same size, 10 nanometers in diameter. Uh, Jessica and Abhishek worked on this. So this is our nanoparticles, and they can be small, and I'll start with small and show then a little bit larger nanoparticles. This nanoparticle was chosen again because of this hydrodynamic radius. It's also Vincent Rotella has the experimental data available for that particular nanoparticle, so it's easier for us to compare. He has only one charge, plus 48. This nanoparticle has 1.5 nanometer gold core and 135 gold atoms, has 60 ligands, and then we modify the end of this alkyl chains from um, traditional alkyl chain, right, so hydrophobic, to a charged one, protonated amine. We also see that as we modify the charge uh, of the ligands, again, ligands are hydrophobic, so in polar solvent, you're going to see the pack up like this, right, so this is going to be a change in shape, and as you increase the uh, um, charge on the end groups of nanoparticles, you're going to see the change in the shape, overall shape of the nanoparticle. The um, potential that we chose here for the gold is all harmonically bonded, so it's not a Leonard Jones, and the gold is not charged, not reactive, but retains all the degrees of freedom, so it can migrate throughout the um, everything. So as you can see here, it rotates and moves around, so the core of the gold is not fixed. Nothing is fixed here. It's again, we're looking at um, different um, levels of the salt concentration. This is 0 0.1. Here, this, we have plus 18 charge. This is plus 30. And this is plus 60 nanoparticle charge. We can see that the ligands, again, behave differently. All right, so we see the packing of the hydrophobic core of the ligands again. And we see that plus 18 does not really do anything with DNA, it just kind of interacts with this weakly. Plus 30 causes local small bending, and plus 60 actually able to bend the DNA pretty well. If we compare this, and we compare this by calculating end-to-end -end distance of the DNA versus nanoparticle charge, and two different salt concentrations. One is, you know, traditional 0.1 mole sodium chloride, another one is neutralized only. So it's basically a zero mole and a neutralizing ions. What we see here also, this line represents just the end-to-end -end distance of DNA in a solution. This line here is represents the sodium air on a histone. It's the same sequence for both structures. We can see that if we have a low charge, the DNA retains its fold, it's all an explicit solvent. Then we have an intermediate um, structures, for, for example, from plus 30, we see intermediate folding. And then um, at certain charges, we see a nice folding of the um, DNA. So for example, plus 48 seems to be folding it better than plus 60. It's a little bit over compactifying DNA. And in a low salt concentration, it's completely collapsed DNA itself. Yes, there's no ions, 60. Because DNA would be plus, uh, minus 60, and then you have plus 60. And here we'll have, what is this, 12 ions and something like that. So we can see two different regimes, no DNA bending and DNA bending, right? So this is more less interesting for us because it's just basically leaves the DNA intact, has a certain binding energy to this. However, this region is more interesting in terms of which nanoparticle is the best that will uh, compactify the DNA in the same fashion as a histone. How do we determine this? Again, we take, um, DNA has six degrees of freedom, right? So the most important ones for the bending are roll, twist, uh, tilt, and twist. The tilt is the most energetic, has the highest energetic penalty in general by itself. So we can compare the histone bending and then from plus 30, plus 48, plus 60. So this is contribution from tilt. On the bending, this is the highest contribution, so from roll, then tilt, Twist has no contribution to wrapping it on a histone. Then if we combine roll and tilt, we can see most of the contribution arose, arises from here. And the final snapshot shows us that 
if we compare it to histone, the plus 60 actually has a very similar actual bend. So the nanoparticle is very high charge, actually has a similar bend to the histone. The plus 48 has a less bend on the histone. However, if we compare 48 and 60, and now we put um, two uh, nanoparticles and much longer DNA in general, and just want to see which one will do it faster. So it's uh, a little bit easier to see. Again, it's all atoms, there is no united atoms here. So hydrogens are all present. We can see that plus 60 compactifies the DNA much faster than plus 48. Both of them are successful in terms of compactifying DNA. But again, plus 60 does a much better job in a way that it does it faster. Faster and not necessarily better, though, because it might be that plus 60 over um, compactifies the DNA. If we look at DNA versus RNA, the difference is the persistent rings, basically, and the helical rise. So it's much stiffer um, molecule. And we'll look at the same end-to-end -end distance contributions. We can see that if we have it in physiological pH, oh, sorry, at a 0.1 mole sodium concentration, the RNA does not bend at all. So only can has no salt. And if we look at DNA versus RNA, this is salt concentration versus nanoparticle charge. Again, we see that RNA doesn't have a nice bending, even though some people believe that you can really nicely wrap the psi RNA in the nanoparticles for the drug delivery. We don't see any of the nice um, smooth bending, which will basically not allow the enzyme to digest the RNA. We don't find any uh, parts here that allows us to do the phase absorption of, the, of RNA on the nanoparticle. Depends on the charge. Um, also, I'll just skip this, I think, and show you that um, we notice that more spherical nanoparticles lead to much better folding in general of the um, DNA, much smoother folding, so the shape of the nanoparticles are important. So it's based on nanoparticle anisotropy. So because of this, we decided to look at two different cases. This is with peg ligands, more hydrophilic, so it makes it more spherical particle, and this is just much larger core. So we increase the core and reduce the length of the um, ligands. Apparently, if we have a very large core, even though the charges are the same, the hydrodynamic radius are the same, but the flexibility of the ligands are reduced because they're shorter, we cannot bend the DNA as well. So it does not want to bend on a large nanoparticle. I am just going to stop right here because I have too many things anyhow. I'm just going to skip this all and go right here. So we also looked at the nanoparticle concentration versus nanoparticle charge. We found three different regimes for DNA. Here, we actually have damaged DNA, the DNA for, with a very small charges and hydrophobic ligands denaturates upon absorption. So it's again phase absorption. Here, we have a nice smooth bending of DNA, and then the largest region here where we have basically DNA structure is still straight. Either we have a very low charges or we have high charges and high concentration that stretches the DNA in between the nanoparticles. So, um, overall, since I spoke almost an hour, I don't know how that happened. Um, I'd like to thank my group again. Uh, people who work on this, uh, Ho Shin, he worked on, again, he's primarily working on the surfaces and biomolecules, and Jessica and Abhishek, who is a postdoc in my group, they working on the nanoparticles interactions with, uh, again, designing the nanoparticles for a specific um, response of biomolecules. And now funding, of course. And thank you.